Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Member for Portage Liscar. Mr. Speaker, Canadians need to get back to work. We need to see jobs in every region and in every sector in this country. We know the United States is our closest ally and friend, and trade between us exceeds $1.5 billion per day. However, several U.S. policies are hurting our economy, and the Prime Minister is doing nothing to address it. Conservative, the Conservative motion today will create a special committee to ensure our ongoing cooperation with the U.S. with a goal to find solutions. Will the government support this motion? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Our government knows how to defend Canada, as we showed in our successful NAFTA negotiations and in the 232 tariff fight. By contrast, when the going got tough, the Conservatives lost their nerve. The future leader of the official opposition actually said, I believe that many of the Canadian retaliatory tariffs should be dropped as they are not worth their symbolic nature. Conservatives wanted to wave the white flag, but Canadians can trust our government to fight for them. The Honourable Member for Portage Liscar. Mr. Speaker, does the Deputy Prime Minister not realize that Canadians have already suffered tens of thousands of job losses because of the pandemic, and now with Biden's cancelling of Keystone, the threat to Line 5, and his Buy American policy, tens of thousands of more jobs are at risk? Canadian, Canada's unemployment is already the third highest in the G7. Up to 30,000 jobs alone are at risk if Line 5 is cancelled. Do the Liberals not realize the seriousness of this situation? These are good paying jobs, many of them unionized. So again, when will the Prime Minister do his job and protect Canadian jobs now and in the future? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely appreciates the importance of the Canada-US trading relationship, and we have shown that we are able to work in a Team Canada approach to maintain that relationship. And when the going gets tough, Mr. Speaker, we are willing to stand and fight to defend the national interest. When it comes to jobs, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that Canada has already had a robust recovery from the depths of the COVID recession, much stronger than the one we're seeing in the United States. The Honourable Member for Portage Liscar. Well, if, if the Liberals believe in a Team Canada approach, they will support our motion uh, and support establishing this special committee. But, Mr. Speaker, everyone knows that there will be no economic recovery until Canadians can start to open up their businesses and their lives and get back to and they and that they can get back to work. But that, Mr. Speaker, will not happen until we get vaccines. The Prime Minister has failed miserably to deliver vaccines or even be clear and honest on how his September deadline will happen. We are now 34th in the world in the vaccination of our population. Let that sink in, Mr. Speaker. 34th and dropping. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely appreciates the urgency of getting vaccines to Canada. That's why Canada has secured 10 doses of vaccine per Canadian. We have the most comprehensive and the most diverse vaccine portfolio in the world. We've already received more than 1.1 million doses. We will receive 6 million doses by the end of the first quarter. And every Canadian who wants to be vaccinated will be by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, we're all Canadians. We are all proud of our country. But this morning, I feel bad for my country because the government has not properly secured its vaccine agreements. And the result is that Canada is knocking on the door of the COVAX fund. Mr. Speaker, Canada is the only G7 country to be using the COVAX fund. It's humiliating. How could the Canadian government let things get this far out of hand. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will never apologize for having done everything in its power to vaccinate Canadians as quickly as possible. The COVAX fund was always part of our supply strategy 
and it is working. We were clear from the beginning. No one will be safe until everyone is. We are endeavoring to vaccinate all Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, we all want the eco economy to come roaring back after COVID, but this involves vaccination. And the government keeps saying we have a plan, we have a lot of expectations. And the result, Mr. Speaker, is that we're going to use an organization that is there to help the poorest countries of the country. And then on the other hand, the government says, oh, things are coming. But Mr. Speaker, this is dishonorable. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that he'll never apologize. But can he apologize to Canadians for not keeping the promise he made to them in terms of regular access to vaccines? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. I'm I absolutely agree with all the members of this House that the questions of vaccines is urgent. And that is why we obtained 10 doses of vaccines per Canadian, which is the most complete and diverse portfolio of vaccines in the world. Canada will receive more than six doses by the end of the first quarter. and. All Canadians who wish to be vaccinated will be able to do so by the end of the month of September. COVAX is part of our plan, and that was the plan from the beginning. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, bad news is piling up about the vaccine supply. 70% fewer doses from Pfizer, 20% less from Moderna, and it's going down again. And it's so bad that Canada is having to dip into the COVAX pro program for poor countries. We're the only G7 country to do this, and it's very embarrassing. The Prime Minister has clearly not shown that he deserves our blind trust. On the contrary, more than ever, we, he has to be transparent. Will he make the contracts and the vaccine supply schedule public? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, with respect to COVAX, our government will never apologize for having done everything in its power to vaccinate Canadians as quickly as possible. COVAX was always part of our strategy, and other partners, such as New Zealand, is also part of it. And this mechanism is working. We're on the right track to have at least 2 million doses of the vaccine delivered worldwide by the end of 2021. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker. Everyone wants to be vaccinated by September, and there are experts saying that this won't happen before summer of 2022. And I trust more these foreign experts because it's not in their interest to lie. Of course, these are forecasts because the government is still hiding this information. All we know is that there's bad news nonstop. We're now ranked 33, 33rd in terms of vaccination worldwide worldwide, and that this number keeps on dropping, when will the Prime Minister tell us his plan? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to reassure the Bloc member, for whom I have great respect, that our government shares this urgency with respect to vaccination. And this is why the General Major Danny Fortin is sharing information with the provinces and territories and with all Canadians. I would also like to stress once again that all Canadians who wish to be vaccinated will be able to do so by the end of September. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I remember the vaccine announcements. People were encouraged. It was a bit of hope during these tough times, but Delays announced means that people will fall ill and they will, people will lose their lives. And now we don't know how many vaccines from Moderna we'll get next week or the week after. Why? Why did the government let people down?
the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada obtained 10 doses of vaccine per Canadian, which represents the most complete and diverse portfolio in the world. Health Canada approved Pfizer's and Moderna's vaccines, and our regulators are also looking at three vaccine candidates and reviewing them, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Novavax. This will allow us to vaccinate all Canadians who wish to do so by the end of the month of September. South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I remember when the COVID-19 vaccines were announced, how people were encouraged. It was a little bit of hope in a difficult time. But then the delays were announced by this government, which means that more people will get sick and more people will lose their lives. On top of the delays, we're also learning that Canada is the only country in the G7 that is going to access COVAX, which is vaccine supply meant for developing countries. How did the Liberal government let things get so bad? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will never apologize for doing everything in our power to get Canadians vaccinated as quickly as possible. COVAX has always been part of Canada's procurement strategy, and the COVAX mechanism is working precisely as designed. We've been clear from the start. No one will be safe until everyone is. We're focused on getting Canadians vaccinated while making sure the rest of the world is vaccinated too. Honourable member for Calgary, Nose Hill. The Deputy Prime Minister just said that the Liberals did everything in their power to get Canadians vaccines. But this morning, the Minister said that the Liberals failed to secure the right to produce Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca vaccines in Canada because they didn't have the capacity to produce them here. Now, the UK was in the same boat that we were 10 months ago, but they've managed to pr secure domestic production capacity. So if the Liberals did everything in their power to secure Canadians' vaccines. Why didn't they do what the UK did, instead leaving us entirely dependent on other countries to produce vaccine for us? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada pursued a strategy of pursuing the earliest possible vaccines that we could secure from among all of the vaccine candidates in the world. That is why we've reached agreements with seven vaccine manufacturers, five of whom we've, of course, received encouraging clinical data from, two of which have already been approved and are being deployed on Canadian soil. And every Canadian who wishes to receive a vaccine from among those two approved vaccines will have access to one by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, the member just said that they pursued a strategy to get us the earliest vaccine possible at what, behind every other country in the world? Early as possible? Like, we don't have any right now. So again, like, I think about the United States. They turned a convention center into a hospital in a week. China built an entirely new hospital in 12 days. The United Kingdom built their vaccine capacity in 10 months. The Liberals were sitting around talking with Can Sino at a time when they should have been building our capacity out. And they admitted that this affected our right to produce these vaccines at home. Why the fail? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, while other countries were acting, Canada was also acting, securing PPE for our frontline medical workers and our provinces, working carefully uh, on securing vaccine agreements with seven leading manufacturers around the world, working indeed on building up our domestic ability to produce long-term vaccines, and working, of course, to get those vaccines into Canada and into Canadian arms at the earliest possible date. That means that every Canadian that wishes to receive a vaccine will have access to one by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Economist Intelligence Unit reports that the federal government is talking about an irrealistic timetable when it says that all Canadians who want to be vaccinated by end of September will be able to. It probably won't be able to deliver on that promise until 2022. Also, we learned yesterday that Canada is the only G7 country that will be taking from the COVAX fund. When will this Prime Minister stop being dishonest with Canadians and tell them, tell them the unvarnished truth? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada obviously acted quickly to secure sufficient doses to vaccinate all Canadians. 
it did this on many occasions, we'll have enough, we already have enough vaccines approved by the end of September, so that all Canadians who wish to be vaccinated can do so by then. In terms of the COVAX, Canada is proud in its participation in this program, which it plans to provide vaccines to developing country, and that's the very object of COVAX, so that Canadians can obtain vaccines through this program, and that's what makes it works, work. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au saint charles Mr. Speaker, I'm not proud to have to dip into the COVAX fund to bail Canada out. Pfizer and Moderna do have vaccines that are approved, but we will receive fewer doses than expected, and that's why we're dipping into COVAX. That's not normal. And the Prime Minister has to really tell people the truth. And if there's a vaccine issue, we don't want to find out in six months. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the COVAX Foundation is intended for everyone to have access to vaccines. Richer countries can buy them, and poor countries can receive donations. Canada was one of the first countries to make a donation to the COVAX program, and we can be proud of what we've done and what we are doing to ensure that everyone will get vaccines. For Wellington Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the government is seeking an exemption agreement to protect Canadian jobs from the Biden administration's Buy American policy. As the government pointed out the other day, Canada is the number one customer of 32 American states. Has the government reached out to any of these 32 state governors to seek their support to oppose these Buy American policies? Has the government asked Canada's premiers to reach out to their gubernatorial counterparts? The Bull Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that question. We are taking a Team Canada approach as we have uh, as we have done over the last five years. The Prime Minister has spoken to the President and has also spoken to the Vice President. Our terrific ambassador in the U.S. is uh, having discussions at all levels. I am looking forward to speaking to my counterpart once that confirmation process takes place. But please be assured that absolutely this is a Team Canada approach as we work with businesses, with exporters, with uh, with officials and, uh, and with colleagues. Uh, Hello? The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Oh, oh good. Okay. All right. All right. Mr. Speaker, in 2009, when faced with the Buy American policies of the Obama administration, the previous government worked with the 10 provincial premiers to present a united front to secure an exemption agreement. Is this government going to do the same thing? Is it going to convene a first minister's meeting on this issue? The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm very pleased to work with my provincial and territorial colleagues. Uh, it was just very recently that we had a very good meeting at uh, the provincial, territorial and federal level to talk about trade and to talk about that road to recovery and indeed how we work together with provinces and territories uh, on this road to recovery to ensure that Canadian businesses and our workers have the full support of all of us working as Team Canada. Before continuing, I just want to make sure that uh, it's clear that all the members who are joining us virtually, uh, please think of a, almost as a paranoid way of looking at things that your microphone is always on. So if you're going to speak, uh, whether it's to the microphone or someone else, just check to see if the mute signal is on and it'll be uh, much better for everyone involved. Alors, on va continuer. So we're going to move on with oral questions. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Limoilieu. Mr. Speaker, even though the bad news is piling up, this government keeps on saying that we will receive 6 million vaccine doses by the end of March. I hope so, but it must reveal all the information that allows it to say that. Because right now, halfway through, we've just received over a million doses. And we know that Moderna is going to announce a new drop in deliveries for the week of February 22nd. So the shortage will last at least until the end of the month. To reach 6 million doses by the end of March, the Prime Minister will have to find a million doses a week, at least. Can he unveil his detailed plan? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, Canada has seven supply agreements for vaccines with five for five different vaccine candidates, which is encouraging news. Two of these vaccines are approved and will receive six million of those doses by the end of March, like the member has just said. And Canada, obviously, will continue to get more supplies of vaccines so that every Canadian who wishes to be vaccinated will will have one by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Limoilu. Mr. Speaker, people must be able to trust the government, but it's hard because on the one hand, the government is not being transparent, and on the other hand, everything we're learning is worrisome. Canadians aren't reassured to see the government digging into the COVAX program, and it's not reassuring to see that Canada has to dip into the vaccine supply for developing countries in order to hope to catch up. People deserve to know the real state of affairs. When will the government announce its contracts and vaccine supply schedule? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will disclose the amounts of the vaccines that we're expecting on a regular basis. We are obviously experiencing temporary delays for the two approved vaccines, but we will receive 6 million doses by the end of Q1. In terms of COVAX, that's the very object of that pro program. Other developed countries also will receive vaccine supplies and then during the first half of the program, and the second half of the program will provide vaccines to developing countries countries, and Canada can be proud of, it, proud of its participation. The Honourable Member for beauport Molu. We're the only G7 country to do that. And, and then we're going to give to the poor after. We're, we're going to take from this fund. We're the only country to do so. The Prime Minister said we're going to get ahead of vaccines, but we're really late. We're at the very bottom of the ranking of countries. The Prime Minister hasn't proven that we can trust him, even though we hope we can. When will he put his entire procurement plan on the table, not just the targets, the plan? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're providing our provincial and territorial part partners with regular updates on the amounts of vaccines they can expect. We are publishing the vaccine doses that we expect to receive in the coming quarters. Canada has as a vaccine supply a system that is very advanced and Canadians can be reassured that all Canadians who wish to be vaccinated will be able to do so by the end of September. Delkirk Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Armed Forces has launched an investigation into the serious allegations of sexual misconduct by former Chief of Defence Staff General Vance. We know from news reports the Defence Minister was made aware of these allegations back in 2018 by the Defence Ombudsman and then referred it to the Privy Council Office. When did the Defence Minister first brief the Prime Minister? When he first learned of these allegations or just this week when the story broke? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have no tolerance for any form of sexual misconduct. This is something I take very seriously. I also want to acknowledge the courage of the survivors who have come forward. I have always ensured that any allegations that are brought to my attention have been, re have been reported to the appropriate authorities to begin an investigation regardless of rank or position. I've always followed all the appropriate processes in pursuing issues related to workplace harassment whenever allegations have arisen. We will ensure a full, thorough, independent investigation is conducted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, these are serious complaints against General Vance. They were brought directly to the Defence Minister's attention by the Defence Ombudsman, and he had a responsibility to follow up after what he just said in, in re reporting it up. Now, the Minister has a duty to every serving member in uniform. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said all investigations are taken seriously, regardless of rank or position. Now, did the Defence Minister ensure the Privy Council Office and the Prime Minister's Office were aware of these allegations in May 2019 before they gave General Vance a salary increase. 
The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I stated earlier, I have always ensured that any allegations that are brought to my attention have been reported to the appropriate authorities to begin an investigation, regardless of rank or position. And at that, I have followed all appropriate process, processes in pursuing issues related to workplace harassment whenever allegations have arisen. We will always take a no-tolerance policy when it comes to sexual misconduct, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Far too many members in uniform have experienced sexual harassment or misconduct, trapped in a culture where their voices aren't heard. This government promised change, with all investigations to be taken seriously. Yet, Canada's former top general is being accused of very bad the very behaviour he was responsible for eliminating. The Minister de of Defence knew this and did nothing for three years. This minister broke the sacred trust of the military to protect it from harm. How will the Prime Minister regain it? The Honourable Minister. Earlier, we have no toler tolerance for any form of sexual misconduct. This is something that I take very seriously. I have always ensured that any allegations that are brought to my attention have been reported to the appropriate authorities to begin an investigation, regardless of rank or position, and that I have always followed all appropriate processes in pursuing issues related to workplace harassment whenever allegations have arisen. And in this case here, we will ensure a very thorough, full, independent investigation is conducted. Thank you. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, what is going on at Veterans Affairs? The Union of Veterans Affairs employees recently found that one in three staff had experienced harassment in the workplace. Harassment and discrimination have no place at work, especially not in a government department. No wonder staff turnover is so high and backlogs are continuing to grow. Veterans are tired of excuses. Will this minister finally stand up for workers and for veterans and create a safer work environment so our veterans get the help they deserve? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we take reports of workplace harassment very seriously. And we have made it absolutely clear that everybody deserves to work in a safe and healthy environment. My department has received the survey from the union and has met uh, with them to discuss it. We will continue to work closely with the union to address these issues. Employees of Veterans Affairs Canada do exceptional work on behalf of veterans every single day, and they deserve a safe workplace just like everyone else. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rosemont-La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals seem to think they can do better than the U.S. on climate change, but actually it's the opposite. The Biden administration has ended the Keystone XL pipeline project, but the Liberal government here has bought the pipeline for billions of dollars. The Biden administration has shown leadership by ending subsidies to fossil fuel producers, whereas the Liberal government is sending hundreds of millions of dollars to oil companies. And yet, the Liberals are saying that they are great defenders of the environment. That's real hypocrisy, and it's lasted long enough. Can the Prime Minister say today that he will end subsidies to fossil fuel producers, yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, let me just speak quickly to, to the relationship, the single biggest relationship that we have, the single largest customer for Canadian crude, for instance, which is their biggest export. Uh, and it's not just an issue for Alberta or Saskatchewan. It's an issue for all of Canada. Cross-border energy trade between Canada and the U.S. is over $100 billion each year. You won't find two countries in the world that have their energy sectors linked as closely as we do. Over 70 pipelines and three dozen transmission lines are crossing our border. Mr. Speaker, we will cooperate with the new U.S. administration on areas of common interest, improving continental energy security, and protecting our workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Centre. I just want to remind the Honourable Member she's on mute. No, she's still on mute. Check the mute on your headset. There's a switch on the headset. Maybe that's what's off. Oh, huh? Can you hear me now, Mr. Speaker? There we go. Please proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my microphone has been giving me trouble all morning, actually. 
Mr. Speaker, BC is the maritime province with strong links to Asia Pacific. We also have a unique, diverse, and vast economy. So I welcome our government's proposal to create the specific BC Regional Development Agency. Could the Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages tell the House more about our plan to implement this new BC Regional Development Agency? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank, of course, the member of Vancouver Centre for her question and strong advocacy. Our government understand that, that, understands that British Columbia has specific needs. And that is why, for the first time in history, we will be creating a BC Economic Development Agency mm -hmm. to create and protect jobs in the beautiful province of British Columbia. My colleagues and I have been uh, connecting with entrepreneurs and workers all across the province, and we look forward on establishing this new BC Economic Development Agency for BC people by BC people. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Mr. Speaker, Enbridge is spending $8 billion modernizing Line 3, Canada's main oil transportation link to the United States, since it was approved by President Obama in 2016. The final section to be upgraded is being challenged by the same activists that moved the new U.S. President to cancel Keystone XL. The Prime Minister recently spoke with the U.S. Administration about energy security without any specifics. Before more environmentally destructive policies are decided in a void of real information, will the Prime Minister commit to getting specific on pipelines with the U.S. Administration? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, we approved the Line 3 replacement project, and we did that in order to create good middle-class jobs. Line 3, it's a mixed service line. It carries heavy, sweet, light, and high sour blends of crude from Hardesty in Alberta to Superior, Wisconsin. Construction on the project is complete. It's operational on the Canadian side. Ambassador Hillman has underscored the importance of this line to both state and federal level officials in the U.S. We support our oil and gas workers, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to advocate for projects that support Support North American energy security. Thank you. Honorable Member for Calgary Centre. Mr. Speaker, these are verbal assurances, and verbal assurances leading to no results are not worth the salaries of the story storytellers hired to write them. What Canada needs is action, not stories. Canadian energy workers are receiving an ongoing legacy of failure from this government. Northern Gateway, Energy East, Trans Mountain, Tech Frontier, Keystone XL, and now Enbridge Line 3 and Line 5. When will this government stand up for the people it claims to represent and take action to protect their jobs? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me, let me go through another list, one based on facts. TMX, we approved it. We're building it. More than 7,000 jobs created so far. Line 3, we approved it. Another 7,000 jobs created. NGTL 2021, we approved it, thousands of jobs to be created. LNG Canada, we're building it, thousands of jobs. Orphan and inactive wells, $1.7 billion, thousands of jobs created. And the wage subsidy, more than 500,000 workers kept in their jobs in a pandemic in Alberta alone. That is our record, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister keeps sidestepping the question about what he will personally do to support Line 5. We know of efforts by others in the government to keep Line 5 open, but we need the Prime Minister to show direct leadership here. Does he not understand the impact this will have to jobs in Sarnia-Lambton, Ontario, Quebec and Alberta? When will the Prime Minister pick up the phone and call his American counterparts about Line 5? Honourable Minister. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we take this issue very seriously. Line 5 is vital to our energy security. This is a, it's a line that is a critical economic and energy security link between Canada and the United States, and it has safely operated for over 65 years. It provides good-paying, middle-class jobs for thousands of workers at refineries and in the members' riding in Sarnia, also in Montreal and Lévis, Quebec. I can assure this House we are looking at all our options. Line 5 is a vital pipeline for Canada's energy security. We will continue to advocate for it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sarnia-Lambton. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the Natural Resource Minister supports Line 5, but the Prime Minister is abdicating his responsibility here. He isn't answering questions. He isn't taking personal accountability. When will he pick up the phone and ask President Biden to intervene to keep Line 5 open? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are working every day on this issue. Line 5, as I said, it is vital for Canada's energy security. Ambassador Hillman is making the case in Washington. Consul General Comer is making wrong. the case in Detroit and in Lansing. The Minister of Transport raised it with his counterpart, Transport Secretary Buttigieg, yesterday. The Prime Minister raised the importance of North American energy security with Vice President Harris. I will be raising this issue with the incoming U.S. Energy Secretary as soon as she is confirmed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L'honorable député d'Avignon Lamitis The Honorable Member for Avignon Lamitis Matanamatavidia. Mr. Speaker, the only real way to stop COVID from spreading, COVID variants from spreading, is to vaccinate. But we can't vaccinate because the government has failed in supplying itself with doses. That means that it's more important than ever that the Canadian border be protected. And yet, still today, people who want to travel during spring break can still leave as long as they buy their tickets from an American company rather than a Canadian one. Not only can they do that, but they can even get a great deal on it. How can it be that things have been delayed so long before forbidding non-essential travel? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I encourage my colleague to join me in calling on all Canadians to avoid vacation travel or non-essential travel. We've called on Canadians since last year to do so. We've added quarantine measures. We've enhanced those measures by asking all travelers to be tested before arriving. And now we've added extra measure. So, Mr. Speaker, let there be no confusion. Any Canadian who is traveling on non-essential trip will have the strictest measures in the world, and we're doing so because we want to protect the health of Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pierre boucher patriot Mr. Speaker, this government keeps telling us how strict it is, but if the federal government were really that strict, then we wouldn't still be able to book trips abroad a month and a half after the holidays. If the federal government were really that severe, air companies would have to refund clients instead of giving them discounted flights. If the federal government were really that strict, Quebec wouldn't have had to ask for a delegation of authority to manage quarantine instead. This government has created many loopholes. When is it going to deal with them? The Honourable Minister. My colleague from the Bloc Québécois refuses to admit that our measures are among the strictest in the world. We know that Canadian air companies are not offering flights to the south, and we're in discussion with other companies as well. And in addition, if people do travel, when they return, there are some of the strictest measures in the world. They have to get a test before coming back. They have to quarantine in an approved location for three days and then continue to quarantine at home. Ultimately, we're talking about very strict measures, and my colleagues should have the decency to recognize that. For West Nova. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In a few weeks, we'll have uh, passed, a year will have passed since Canada's worst mass murder occurred in port au -Pic, Nova Scotia. After severe public pressure from family and opposition intervention, this government finally did the right thing and called for a public inquiry. However, the families of the victims are still in the dark and still battling with this Liberal government for answers. Federal institutions must respect the Canadian Victims' Bill of Rights, which includes the right to information. When will the minister provide families with the information that they have been calling for? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd remind the member that um, in direct response to concerns raised by the victims and their families and the people of Nova Scotia, we initiated a public inquiry. We have stood up three commissioners who are now engaged in the important work of getting the answers that people need. Now, the, the independence and the integrity of that public inquiry um, it needs to be honoured and recognised. They have an important job to do. And I'm very confident that upon completion of their important work, they will be able to provide those victims' families and all Nova Scotians with, Scotians with the answers they most certainly need and deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many residents in my riding are frustrated and fed up 
Many medicinal marijuana growers are growing much more than they're permitted to with their licenses, much more than the few plants, and it's causing big problems within our neighbourhoods. All this is happening without any proper supervision and enforcement from Health Canada. When, when residents have asked for help, they've had a revolving door. The RCMP says it's Health Canada's responsibility, and Health Canada does nothing. This practice might help the minister deflect responsibility, but it's doing absolutely nothing for my constituents and Canadians. When will this Liberal government clean up this mess? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and I would remind the member that when we introduce legislation to strictly regulate the production, distribution, and consumption of cannabis, we left in place strong criminal sanctions against those who, who grow and distribute marijuana outside of the regulated regime. We are aware of concerns, and we've listened to Canadians, and concerns with those who would abuse the, the provisions of the, the medical marijuana uh, sc scheme that, that is in, in place. But when people do grow that marijuana and sell it outside of the medical authorizations, they're committing a crime. It is the responsibility of the police of jurisdiction to investigate those crimes and to bring charges where appropriate. Strong penalties exist for those activities, Mr. Speaker, and, and the, the tools are available to law enforcement to control those behaviors. L'honorable député de Portneuf. The Honourable Member for Port Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It was high time that the Prime Minister closed the borders. It should have been done far earlier, but once again, he has created confusion. Which hotels are authorized and when? Will people who have gotten both of their vaccine doses be exempted? And he's once again interfering in provincial areas. We need to ensure that Canadian citizens abroad can plan and decide on their options for their return. When will we get a clear plan with clear dates and guidelines? Honorable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is my colleague who is confusing Canadians. We have been clear from the beginning. Canadians abroad will have to follow these rules they will have to reserve, pay $2,000, carry out a test before they leave, and then after getting off the plane, have another test and then go into quarantine for three days, Mr. Speaker. I don't see what's so confusing about that. And if my colleague spent 10% of the time he spends criticizing us, telling his fellow citizens not to travel, that would really help us out. The Honourable Member for Orléans. Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of the week, the Secretary General of the United Nations expressed serious concerns about the Tigray region in Ethiopia. The UN states that around 3.2 million people, more than half of the population in the region, urgently require humanitarian assistance. The UN High Commission for Refugees has also stated that if nothing is done, things will only get worse. Can the Minister of Global Affairs Tell us about Canada's perspective on the situation and what we're doing to face the humanitarian crisis. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. Canada is extremely concerned about reports of sexual violence and serious human rights violations in Tigray. We would ask all parties to, to assure civilians' protection work to de-escalate the situation and permit immediate unhindered humanitarian assistance. Canada will be granting $3 million in assistance to humanitarian operations in Ethiopia and Sudan. Member for Regina Louvain. On Tuesday, the Prime Minister made the outrageous claim that his government has, and I quote, demonstrated their ability to stand up for Canadian steel and aluminum workers. This comment is so out of touch with the reality of steel workers across our country, especially here in Regina, where my friends like Rod, Mike, and Cortland, plus 600 others, are now out of work. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister apologize to the thousands of Canadian steel workers he and his government has failed to support over the past five years? And the Natural Resources Minister's speaking notes won't help these people get jobs. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
Let me remind the honorable member that our government has stood up for steel and aluminum workers across the country. When the illegal 232 tariffs were imposed, our government imposed dollar for dollar retaliatory tariffs. And thanks to that strong response, we had those tariffs lifted. And Mr. Speaker, if anyone owes steel, owes steel and aluminum workers an apology, it is the leader of the official opposition who called on us to lift those tariffs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cross-border Peace Arch Park in my riding. It's a U.S.-Canada border loophole. I'll, the let, the, I'll let the Honourable Street. Member start over and maybe bring the arm down on her microphone so we can hear clearly. Perfect. Let's we'll start, I keep re, doing we'll restart that. the clock. My apologies. Thank you. I'm sorry. Mr. Speaker, Cross Border Peace Arch Park in my riding is a US Canada border loophole. For Mark Charlene and their neighbors who live next to the park, this is intolerable. Since Washington State reopened its side in May, visitors from across Canada and the US are constantly meeting in the park and returning home. No tracing, no quarantines. We saw many picnics and counted 60 pitch tents last Sunday. Does the minister not see this as a public health issue? Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and of course, well, we have, as, as has been explained several times, implemented some of the strongest measures in the world. And last March, we have essentially closed the border between Canada and the United States for all non-essential travel. And we have continued to maintain th that, those provisions while, while allowing for the movement of essential workers and essential uh, goods across that border. The measures that we put in place do require all, all people re returning from the U.S. to enter into quarantine. Those measures are enforceable with significant fines and consequences for those who break them. We'll continue to do all of the things, Mr. Speaker, that are necessary to help keep Canadians safe. Member for Lethbridge. I believe you're on mute. Try the mute on the actual headset. Maybe that, no, that's not it either. Okay, what we'll do is we'll go to the next question then come back if you don't mind. The Honourable Member doesn't mind checking with uh, IT and go from there. I'll just do it without oh, it. Oh, perfect, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Line 5 is an essential part of Canada's energy supply chain, providing half the oil needs of Ontario and Quebec. It is currently under threat of being cancelled, but the Prime Minister, he hasn't even lifted a finger. Canadians, they need to fill up their gas tanks, they need to heat their homes, and they need to cook their food. Energy is, after all, the fuel of life. <laughs> Wait a second. Is that why the Prime Minister has promised to plant two billion trees? Are we going back to wood-burning stoves? Oh, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I've said, Line 5 has operated sa safely for over 65 years. Enbridge continues to monitor its operations around the clock. They're undertaking checks with remotely operated vehicles. They've got human divers at regular intervals. The tunnel project, which Michigan recently issued permits for, will make a safe line even safer. Over the past 10 years, Enbridge has transported more than 27 billion barrels of crude with a safety delivery record of 99.99%. On this side of the house, Mr. Speaker, we are working hard to support our oil and gas workers and to protect Canada's energy and industrial infrastructure. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, as vaccines continue to arrive in Canada, we know how important it is for all Canadians to get vaccinated when the time comes. I know that while our researchers are working hard to ensure that any vaccine is safe for Canadians, some may still have hesitation to get vaccinated. Can the Minister of Health please update us on the work being done to make sure all Canadians have confidence in the COVID vaccines? The Honourable Minister. Well, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question and for her hard work on the Health Committee. We know that we need to do more to ensure that all Canadians have access to reliable, accurate, and timely information about vaccines and the importance of vaccination. And that's why we've announced the Immunization Partnership Fund, which will provide over $30 million for community organizations and leaders to develop tailored and targeted tools and resources that can increase vaccine confidence, address barriers to access and acceptance within their communities. So I encourage all organizations to apply and for every Canadian to get vaccinated when their time comes. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Last week, President Biden announced a freeze on U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Here in Canada, the Liberals continue to fuel the very war they condemn by exporting arms to a country with one of the worst human rights records in the world. This is not right. If the U.S. can do it, so can we. We must protect Canadian workers and uphold human rights. When will the Liberals stop selling deadly weapons to Saudi Arabia, fueling one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Government of Canada is committed to a stronger and more rigorous arms export system. That is why we acceded to the Arms Trade Treaty and human rights considerations are now at the centre of our export regime. I, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, will deny any permit application where there is a risk of human rights violation. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday in question period, the Prime Minister said he was, quote, pleased to see the United States follow our lead in banning fossil fuel subsidies. Liberals promised in 2015 to end fossil fuel subsidies and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. On the contrary, though, between 2014 and 18, both went up. Greenhouse gas emissions up, fossil fuel subsidies up, even before adding the $17 billion for Trans Mountain. So my question to my Liberal friends is, how is the vertigo that you're now experiencing from no longer being able to discern up from down? The Honourable Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In November, our government introduced a climate plan that demonstrates how Canada will exceed its Paris Agreement targets and will uh, create jobs and economic prosperity for the future. As part of this, our government is committed to phasing out inefficient subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies by 2025, and we are on track to do so. We were pleased to see the Americans follow our lead in committing to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Canada has already eliminated eight tax measures for in, the, in that sector, and we are working with Argentina on a peer review of fossil fuel subsidies. Our government will continue working with Canadians to cut pollution and to grow our economy. 